Welcome everybody. Had enough good weather ready for some bad now? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I felt like the luckiest person in the world weather-wise this week. Um, we had a, our main breaker box replaced and we had the guy out Friday to just to give us an estimate and look at it and see what needed to be done. And of course it was such a gorgeous day. He said, you know, I, I don't have anything. I could, I could do it today or we can reschedule it for later. And I said, it's 60 degrees and it's February, do it today. <laughs> because the electricity was off all day. We didn't even get chilly. It was fabulous, almost scary. Uh, Remind everybody to turn off their phones. I got mine off ahead of time today. I think that's a world record. Uh, turn them off or put them on airplane mode so that the people on Zoom can actually hear us. It enhances their meeting greatly. Um, I forgot to bring the hymn book up. See how I am? Uh, opening him is Worship in Song, the green one, number 11, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And Amanda is going to lead us in her spring dress. Our uh, centering thought today comes from an evangelical Quaker, but an older one, and actually one of my favorite ones, Hannah Whittle Smith. Uh, kind of a loose cannon she was. Never heard of that in Quakerism. Uh, anyway, 
I waver about myself continually. Sometimes I feel sure I have progressed wonderfully and my present sphinx-like calm and indifference to everything, whether inward or outward, except the will of God is very grand. And then again, I think I am utterly irreligious and a lazy fatalist with not a spark of divine in me. I do wish I could find out which I am. But in all events, my orthodoxy has fled to the winds. I am broad, broader, broadest. So broad that I believe everything is good or has a germ of good in it and nothing to be refused if it be received with thankfulness. Time for announcements. We're going to start as we have traditionally done now with the Zoom people and the announcements from Zoom. No? Okay. Then we're going to do right here, and I have several, so I'm just going to hog it and start off. Um, <clears throat> first, on the table out front, we have uh, congregational and pastoral evaluation forms. These are very similar to ones we've used before. There's a deadline down at the bottom. You can fill them out on the paper form, or we have also emailed them if you're on the email list. You can fill them out that way and send them back in. Uh, if you return them here, please leave them in the ministry and council mailbox out there. It's not up in the top mailboxes, it's down in the black ones at the bottom, but it is labeled. Um, and February 25th, which is two weeks, we're having a soup lunch in what we assumed was going to be dreary February, and so far it's been, who knows. Anyway, we're having a soup lunch, whatever it is. Uh, it will be a pitch in. Uh, ministering council members will be bringing soup and bowls and such related items. And uh, you can bring whatever you want. So it is a pitch in. There, It will be kind of a skimpy meal if you, we only have the ministering council soup. But we like to eat, I know. And then third, this just came in on my phone right before I turned it off here before a meeting. Uh, right sharing uh, is having a Zoom workshop uh, on the power of enough um, starting February 14. It's five weeks every Wednesday, I believe it is, uh, at either 1.30 or 7.30. Um, and uh, I'll, we will forward that out on through our email so that you can get the details and sign up if you're interested. Okay, anybody else got anything? I'm sure they do. Thank you. This is Anita Kamek, and just a reminder that next Sunday will be our uh, meeting for business at the Rise of Worship shortly thereafter. Thank you. Um, and another reminder, all clerks, we're going to meet via Zoom on Tuesday evening at 7. Right. Okay. right, we're just going to keep doing this. Okay, <laughs> Joanne Gully, a uh, reminder for the uh, people that are participating in book club, we are doing that today at 12 o'clock, and for people that are on Zoom, you should have received the link. So, Women's Book Club, Women R Rowing North, at noon today in the dining room. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, it's Super Bowl Sunday! Yeah. <laughs> That's the most enthusiastic announcement we've had in a while. <laughs> now we'll turn it over to Mark. And as Mark makes his way forward, I think we would be remiss to not point out that today is his birthday. Uh, for the anniversary of this birthday. <laughs> the anniversary of this birthday. 
<clears throat> my mother and I went to the hospital together, and we left separately. <laughs> Let us pray. Give us discerning hearts, O God, that among all the things that weigh us down and worry us and cause us to be gloomy and despairing, we may discern the goodness you pour into our lives that we may discern all of the reasons to be grateful and thankful. That in all things, we may see the light, your light, shining in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Oh God, help us to see. Open our eyes, open our hearts to each other and to the world so that as we see the pain and suffering in places far away or nearby, they may shape us in love and caring and empathy. Oh God, we turn to you because we know that you have the capacity to light us up, to open us up, and to lead us on. Amen. I deliver food each week for family promise to poor families in the Plainfield area. And this week I got really busy on Monday, which is my usual delivery date, and I couldn't do it until Tuesday. Um, I was delivering food to a family, a single mother with two uh, young sons. And when I went to their house on Tuesday, the woman was so grateful. She said, we had ran out of food and we missed you yesterday. So for me, what was a scheduling inconvenience meant for them they had gone a day without food. Um, we live in a time, unfortunately, when so many people um, live on the edge of sustainability. And so um, that is uh, the reason we collect food each uh, Tuesday or each Sunday here. We don't pass a plate, we pass a wagon and we pass baskets, and we ask you to fill them so that in turn, we can get food out to those who need it. If you didn't bring anything today, feel free to put cash in. We have committee members who will use it, take that money, go buy meat, eggs, proteins for our families, and make sure they get fed. So Michael, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And we'll probably need some basket carriers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Eureka! <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
Michael, I miss you when you're gone. <laughs> oh, well. It's my birthday this past week. I turned 63 and thought it important to have a little preventative maintenance done on my chassis. <laughs> so Monday had my teeth cleaned. Tuesday had six precancerous lesions frozen off, fasted on Wednesday in preparation for a colonoscopy on Thursday, <laughs> which did not begin well when I received word that the procedure would be done by a visiting gastroenterologist from Minnesota. <laughs> a visiting doctor from four, three states away, a gastroenterologist, visiting doctor. Apparently this is a thing now done to lessen the chances of having your colonoscopy done by someone you might later see at the grocery store. So they just all do this, come in from all over so that you don't meet these people ever again. But this doctor walked into my room there, my little cubicle where I was laying on the gurney and he was reading my chart from my last colonoscopy five years ago, and he had a frown on his face. And he said, it looks like they found some very scary polyps the last time you were here, which was news to me. I would have remembered that and worked it into conversations. <laughs> a missed opportunity for a hypochondriac. As you can imagine, news of my almost cancer was somewhat alarming, so alarming I forgot to tell my classic colonoscopy joke about finding my father's boot from 1977. <laughs> Fortunately, the doctor said everything was fine, that my colon was perfect. I have never in all my life been so proud of an internal organ. <laughs> So that was my week. How was yours? I hope well. <laughs> On a lighter note, a higher note, you'll remember that last week we discussed osmosis, about the gradual assimilation of the highest ideals we can imagine, and how Quakerism for me has always been a community in which one soaks up and absorbs the virtues we treasure, like compassion and mercy and generosity and thoughtfulness and kindness. I just love those words and the feelings they conjure up. I promised last week that we'd be thinking about the key features of Quakerism, the qualities that make us Quakers, we are now entering the treacherous landscape of theology, where one misstep can prove disastrous. So it behooves us to heed the protocol, to ask the questions in the right order, because if we don't, you are all familiar with the notion that if you have two lines that begin very closely, where one line begins to deviate, you grow further and further apart, 
And this is how bad theology always starts and gets worse. You don't ask the important questions right up front and deal with it uh, right where you should. And after a while, you end up with horrible, horrible theology like Christian nationalism. So this is how this all begins. So anytime we have a theological uh, process, we have to make sure we're beginning in, in the right place. And I suggest to you that the right question to start with is this, how are God's preferences known? How do we know and discern God's will? If that isn't our first question, it should definitely be our second. Uh, the Baptist down the road would say, well, that's easy. God's will is revealed in the Bible. Uh, the Catholics would remind us that before the Bible reached its formation, we had church tradition and hierarchy, so we need to follow that. Joel Osteen would say, we know something is God's will if it makes us rich and happy. The reason we begin with the question of knowing God's will is because the discernment of God's will and human power are always closely related. One follows the other. Uh, whoever has the authority to tell us God's will, you'll notice, is the person who ends up with all the cards. Uh, or in the case of Joel Osteen, a 17,000 square foot mansion, like a man with six motorcycles has room to talk. <laughs> But think about it, whenever, whenever someone claims to be the authoritative source of divine will, it always ends up as a grab for power, as a grab for control, as a grab for wealth. The abuse of that power gave birth to Quakerism, which was an energetic, that's the only word for it, an energetic reaction and rejection of ecclesiastical and hierarchical authority in order to embrace what I will call the democratic discernment of God's will. The democratic discernment of God's will. We Quakers believe God's will is not known through a book or a person or a hierarchy, but is instead known through democratic discernment, a process of careful listening involving all the community, a process in which everyone participates in which all perspectives are heard, weighed, and considered. Who holds the power in democratic discernment? Where does it rest? Not with one person or a hierarchy or even a book. It rests with the community, with the meeting. When I was pastoring up in the city, uh, woman, just a tremendous woman, we became dear friends. She began attending our meeting. Um, she had uh, become a Christian as an adult, attending an evangelical church led by a charismatic uh, minister uh, who had to leave that church uh, for, for vision problems. Um, he mistook his secretary for his wife and so that didn't work out. He left there, and she was kind of um, traumatized by that, so began looking for another church to go, and she started coming to our Quaker meeting because she lived right down the street from us. And her second week there, she wanted to start a children's program, and she came to see me wanting my permission to start it. Um, I said to her, that's not my call. In a Quaker meeting, decisions are made by the by the body, by the congregation, not by the pastor. Um, she said, but in my old church, the pastor was in charge. Why aren't you in charge? And 
no one has ever asked me that before because people have generally known me well enough to know why I'm not in charge. <laughs> but I explained to her that Quakers believe God's will was known through the gathered community. Uh, I didn't use the term democratic discernment, but that's what I meant. I said, so talk to the meeting about it. And so she talked to the meeting about it, and as she talked to the meeting about it, it became more than just her passion and concern. It became the concern of the entire meeting. And as everyone gathered and shared and talked about the needs in our community, a wonderful ministry to children rose out of that, that involved tutoring, that involved feeding children who would otherwise have gone hungry at night, uh, that involved in this congregation of elderly Quakers providing grandparents to all of the children in our neighborhood who didn't have any. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful because it came out of democratic discernment. We don't concentrate the power of the meeting in the hands of one person or one committee or one position. We invite one another into a relationship and in the context of that relationship, we discern together our way forward, our calling, our mission. When I was a kid, my dad was a thus saith the Lord kind of father. And you know the kind I mean. He told us what to do and we did it, whether we liked it or not. Uh, part of that was a safeguard against chaos. When you have five children in six years, you have to have order. But I'll never forget one evening him calling us into the front parlor of our house and asking us to sit down. He told us he'd been offered a significant job in Ohio that would require our moving over there. He said, this involves all of us, so we'll make the decision together. I want to know what you think. We stared at one another, wondering who had kidnapped our father <laughs> and who was this man who looked just like him. But after the shock wore off, after the shock wore off, we discussed it, going around the circle, each of us talking. None of us wanted to move. We had our friends. We lived in a town we all loved. It was obvious to us that our dad wanted that job. He kept mentioning how nice it would be to have more money, how we could do more things, how he could pay for our college. So I kept waiting for him to say, well, I don't care what you think, we're moving anyway, pack your bags. But he didn't say that. He sat there like a Quaker clerk and said, I have the sense you want to stay here. And though it wasn't a Quaker meeting, when I look back on it now, it might have been my first experience with democratic discernment. I remember sitting there with my family, feeling included and important and empowered, a part of something larger than myself. Friends, you and I live in a culture that has vested great power, some would say overwhelming power, in the hands of a few corporations, politicians, oligarchs, and technology titans. Ours is a gilded age where the few rule the many. There isn't a day that passes that I don't feel powerless, and I'm an old white guy.
I can't imagine what it feels like to be a woman or a person of color in this culture. In times like these, it is imperative, imperative for friends to model a way of living together that cares for and includes everyone, that includes all people and not just a privileged few. We can't wait for democratic discernment to trickle down, settling for crumbs of power, the highest and mightiest toss our way. It is time we not only model the soaring possibilities of cooperative community, it is time we insist on it and work on it for all people, leaving no one behind, no one stranded, broken, and bleeding on the roadside. In this sense, democratic discernment is the highest aim of Jesus, whom you'll remember God anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, whom God sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, whom God commissioned to set the oppressed free. When God sets a table, this is Theology 101, our first, our first assertion, that when God sets a table, there is a seat for everyone. No one chair is higher than any other, no portion larger or more magnificent. We dine at the table as equals. Just as there is no low seat, so too is there no seat of honor. Equal stature, equal voices, equal power, equal people, everyone together partaking. I grew up in a Methodist parsonage, and so <clears throat> the injunctions from God were also parental injunctions. So it's kind of a double whammy with that. And um, so everything was top-down rule. Um, when we were, when I was eight, we moved to a, a new town and um, the parsonage had uh, just wood floors throughout and in the summertime I would uh, I had a little hidey hole down behind a couch where I would hang out with a book or the cat and it was cool down there because we didn't have air conditioning and I would lie down there and I found myself after a short time, staring at the back of the couch, which had a tag on it, which said, do not remove under penalty of law. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And I noticed that tag was in other places. It was on pillows, it was, it was all over the house. And I kept thinking like, well, how, how would they know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And it, and it really scared me. And, and there were times I would like reach out and kind of touch the tag and think, well, what would happen if I just did a little tear? But I, I couldn't do that. And um, I figured out at that time, we lived about a block and a half from the police station. So I thought, well, maybe there's a certain wiring that comes into the house. <laughs> and um, so I didn't mess with it. And if truth be known, I never tore off one of those tags until I was in my 20s, never. 
And so that confusion as a child about being watched and everything is known, it's almost like, you know, he knows when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, which was as confusing with some theology. So um, I think of Cindy and I have been coming about seven or eight months. And um, sometimes I refer to this place as the Quaker Spa. <laughs> And other times I think it, I feel like it's, I've washed up on the shore of an island for, the island for misfit Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then kind of exploring this new place. And uh, truthfully, last Sunday, I think was the first time I really under, started to understand what you were calling democratic discernment. And, and it really touched me. And I, and I thought, I'd, I've been in other services in my life where I felt a presence, whether that's a presence of spirit or God or a presence of everybody there. Um, but I appreciate, uh, again, being, having that experience of being here as I try to understand and through osmosis uh, and re- retranslate personally. Thank you, Linda. Yes, uh, last weekend was quite an experience, wasn't it? 62 years ago, I became Sister Mary Paula Virgin. I entered a community without much thought about community. Part of me was just wanting to escape to a place where I could be with God and everything would be fine. I, I, that experience didn't work out well. <laughs> um, not because there wasn't plenty of nourishing. Um, oh, I feel really privileged about many of the experiences, um, spiritually and theologically, that that afforded. But it was a very authoritarian structure, and that didn't work. <laughs> um, asking permission for every little thing um, really grated on me. So uh, part of what I learned was don't ask, the answer's going to be no anyway, so do it and ask forgiveness or something, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but what I have experienced here is real community. And um, that is becoming even more meaningful. And I experience it as an ongoing um, discernment together, uh, a kind of sharing spiritually that helps us all grow. And it's an ongoing process. And that really feels good to me. It's not a rigid structure. It's a flowing, ongoing, growing process because of people. I have more of a sense of community here than I have experienced, I think, any place else. And I, I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, Phil, you started with words about discerning the will of God, and it r rankled me. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> How about discerning the love of God? And that's what I experience in this community, a living, ongoing process of learning and growing together, for which I am very grateful. <laughs> I 
went to an author talk yesterday and um, she talked about community and she talked about strength and she talked about weakness and she said the good thing about community is when we are feeling strong we are there to carry others and when we are feeling weak the, uh, the rest of the community is there to carry us. And um, that really resonated because um, I know so often if we're feeling weak, um, we tend to withdraw. And that is the time we need our community even more because um, they don't expect us to show up strong every day. Um, because they are there for us and they want to carry us when we cannot carry ourselves. So um, just keep that in mind of this community because regardless of where we are, we are needed. I uh, noted Phil's reference to uh, taking food to a needy family. And I think it's wonderful that the meeting collects food for needy families in the community. Yesterday I went to a food pantry. I pick up uh, food distribution for two needy families, including refugees from Congo. And it was the longest line I've ever been in. It took me 45 minutes to get the food and then I had to uh, go deliver it. Um, and it, uh, I, I, I'm happy that I can do it, but it sort of makes me feel like a chump because it shouldn't be necessary. Nobody should have to rely on these services in this day and age with the wealth we have. But what can you do? I feel helpless. I feel like I'm trying to bail out the Titanic with a thimble. And I just don't know what to do except keep showing up and, and hoping to use some sort of political voice to change the system, but I'm kind of despairing of that. So on that note, I will <laughs> turn the mic back over. Um, I have been struck by a couple of the, the, the big words um, that have been presented. And one of the first ones is the concept of power and powerlessness, powerful. And in this tricky time, as you kind of referred to, Phil, about uh, what we believe, what I can remember, and I'm no scholar really of anything, but I am enough to discern that if it was said that the kingdom of God is within, within us now, there was no differentiation, as you speak about, of people, and that if I am powerful, that I am powerful, that I am the I am of God, because I don't believe there were lies to us about our who we are and our identity, then as a person who may be seen as less, uh, a person who may be um, a target or a victim, a person who is very grateful for any kind of help, a person who can give 
a quite detailed accounting of injustice. It could make me figure out when I'm going to feel powerful, what I'm dependent upon, and what I've come to the conclusion is, is that um, it seems like someone said in the Bible, they asked God what his name was, and he said, I am, you know, or I am. So I forget, it's either him or Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, Popeye's pretty cool in that I am what I am, you know? And he had bottom lines. But what I realized is I have to be very careful about saying who I am in the cooperative experience of this world. That I have to make sure that I don't feel too saddened by challenges, but that I am in the harm, I am a harmonizing note a prayerful note of the I, of the I am. I have been, uh, I've worked in lots of problems. HIV, homelessness, teenage pregnancy, lots and lots of stuff. Because I thought my power came from one understanding, but the other is giving to those people who were powerless. But as a woman whose background is, you know, <laughs> lots of things, because, you know, in slavery, everybody was dipping and nobody was asking and we weren't dating. So <laughs> I have, you know, African American and Indian and da 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 in me. I have to say, you know, who am I? And the only thing I can come up with is I am God. And you am God. And be careful of my language. Be open enough to hear as you speak about, feel about democratic, you know, the other. But I'm not a woman to be pitied. I am a woman as able to help as to be helped and to be helpful. And you never know the magnificent influence of someone who seems to need help. Um, we're all harmonizing notes, powerful in our own right, as far as I understand it. We will return to the Return to the green hymnule, and we will do number 246. I've got peace like a river, which I think is really true right now.
Friends, this week we discern the love of God and we follow it. A bit of advice I read this week that I will share with you now about discernment and discerning our way forward. Be careful when you blindly follow the masses. Sometimes the M is silent. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Turn and greet friends. Thank you. <laughs> that was a fun meeting.